understand that change is a vital link to the growth and development of any healthy organization. If you expect to keep your business green and ripening, you have to also accept the responsibility of directing some part in the complex overhaul of practically everything in your company. I'm talking about from the way you manufacture your goods and services to the way you acquire and maintain your customers. One way leaders encourage change is by cultivating an environment of constantly asking questions and encouraging managers to take risk. Leaders also stimulate change by mandating the reinvention of business practices and products. Change, according to the leaders I interviewed, is the best way to deliver consistently outstanding results. If you examine best-in-class companies, including those organizations that have received the prestigious Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award, and let me add that many of those countries in which this program is being viewed have their own version of the Baldrige Award for Performance Excellence. But if you examine these companies, you will quickly find several points where innovation and change are not only encouraged, but mandated. For example, 3M and ST Microelectronics, both Baldrige Award winners, these two companies expect a continuous stream of new products as part of their revenue mix. Finally, Another important aspect of change that leaders support is the role of the change agent. Charles Farkas and Susie Wetlofer wrote in the Harvard Business Review that, quote, because change can be extremely disconcerting to employees, change agents are deployed to shepherd new ideas through the rough terrain of the organization, unquote. At the same time, when CEOs feel it is important to demonstrate their commitment to fast-paced change, they will take strong actions, including the firing of high-profile managers who are not effecting change quickly enough, or even divesting divisions for the same reason. Also, most CEOs believe that some part of a manager's compensation should be linked to results, and specifically implementing change. Leaders who believe passionately in their ideas and vision are unstoppable. They are relentless. Their determination to succeed is matched only by their persistence and hard work. And that's why this is the fifth value. Many of the leaders I interviewed told me that their defining moment, that point where they knew they had the ability to be successful leaders, was at the point when they had their biggest breakthrough on an important project. I heard many times from many leaders that the long hours, hard work, persistence, and patience was worth it because it defined their values and paved the road for future achievements. And so, my message is a simple one. As Winston Churchill, the great Prime Minister of England, said to the people of Great Britain, never, 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 never give up. The second part of our topic relates to thinking, and specifically how leaders think and what leaders think about. The American poet Robert Frost once said, the brain is a wonderful organ. It starts working the moment you awaken and it does not stop until the moment you arrive at your office. As humorous as that sounds, it's true for many people because once we arrive at the office, our, our energies are consumed by meetings and sorting through our inbox. According to Faith Popcorn, a futurist and author of the Popcorn Report, 
She writes, quote, The trouble in corporations is that too many people with too much power live in a box, their home, and then they travel the same road every day to another box, their office, where they are consumed with yet a third box, their inbox. Leaders avoid this maze of boxes by learning to think outside the box. In my study of leaders, I have found three primary methods that define how leaders think. First, I have found that leaders think for themselves. By this I mean that the great leaders are steadfast in times of turmoil and chaos, when under stress, in times of doubt, anxiety, and even guilt, in their moments of depression and anger, when they are under assault from their harshest critics, in times of abandonment and change, in times of uncertainty and ambiguity. Rarely will the leader waver. Instead, you will witness the leader dig in his heels and challenge the world to prove him wrong as he faithfully champions his vision and dream. Leaders make time for outside activities that stimulate their brain. For example, my interviews with over 125 leaders revealed the following stimulating activities. Walking, hiking, playing golf, swimming, even listening to classical music or jazz, painting, driving themselves to appointments rather than being chauffeured or carpooled, gardening, and even mowing the lawn. Each of these activities allow for the mind to wander and subconsciously it helps the leader explore new creative paths that stimulate ideas and solutions. Secondly, leaders are learners. My interviews with these same leaders reveal that leaders have an insatiable appetite for reading books and newspapers and magazines, listening to informative audio tapes and CDs, and even attending conferences and seminars in order to expand their knowledge base. This learning process also forces the leader to challenge what he or she already knows against what they've learned. And thirdly, I have found that leaders enjoy talking to people about their ideas and theories. They are involved in a rotary or a tech group. They enjoy a stimulating one-on-one -on -one conversation at a cocktail party or corporate event with other creative people. Rarely did leaders I interview tell me that they spent their time at cocktail parties or social events discussing the weather, the stock market, politics, or corporate earning reports. Instead, these leaders enjoyed talking about technology, innovations, and discoveries. They even talked about sports and specifically how a sports team or a great sport legend performed. In terms of what leaders think about, this was also very revealing for me. I found that leaders are more concerned with significance than they are with success. In other words, many of the leaders I interviewed wanted to achieve a legacy of greatness based on their service to others and their contributions to society. They were not overly concerned with amassing great wealth, although many already had achieved this status. Leaders also think about how to inspire and motivate people to support their ideas. They do not think about management-based issues, for the most part, nor do they have a systematic approach to planning. Ideas just seem to come to them, as I noted earlier, because they allow for outside stimulus and tightly control their free time. 
Leaders also think about the company culture rather than the organizational structure. Because most of the leaders I interviewed were not consumed with corporate politics, they were alert to corporate politics but not consumed by it. The leaders were free to focus on cultural issues such as mission and vision and goals. It is through these types of principle-centered activities that leaders are able to create, as Professor John Cotter suggests, a culture of leadership. And finally, I found that leaders think about the future. Leaders enjoy possibility thinking, that is to say, creating scenarios of what the future will look like in 10 or 20 years. They are the modern-day version of Christopher Columbus, willing to set sail in search of new worlds of thought and ways of doing things. I think this explains why so many leaders are inventors and artists. In order for leaders to think outside the box, they must do two things. First, they must create an environment that allows for innovation and creativity. And secondly, they must work in an organization that fosters new ideas and values innovation. One of the great companies over the past 25 years has been 3M of St. Paul, Minnesota, a Baldrige Award winner. 3M expects that 25% of its revenues will come from products introduced within the past five years. So this type of mandate fosters long-term innovation and encourages small ventures in which new ideas can be tested and brought to market. There's no time for employees to rest on past achievements at 3M. And as the founder of Porsche Cars once responded, when asked by a reporter, which one of your Porsche cars are you most proud of? Mr. Porsche replied, it hasn't been invented yet. In closing, I'd like to encourage you to take to heart the five virtues that so many leaders mentioned and I have shared with you today. Because I believe that successful managers and leaders must first believe in themselves if they are to succeed in life and their work. Secondly, I think it's important for you to understand how others perceive you in the workplace. Understand that each of us has a different learning style and personality, and therefore there is no one leadership approach or success formula that will work for everybody. So be yourself but also be aware that by being you some people just won't be able to relate to you. The leader understands that and accepts it. But he or she never stops trying to find creative ways to motivate and inspire people and keep his or her organization moving forward. And lastly, the leader knows that success is never guaranteed. That's why the leader uses actions and deeds and symbolism, not just words alone, to accomplish his or her mission. By thinking outside the box, you can be a more effective and perceptive leader. Thank you. Now we'll continue with our second question and answer se uh, session. Thanks for your excellent questions. Uh, and the next site we have a uh, call coming from is uh, Estado de México, uh, the Universidad Tecnológica de uh, Tecámac. Good morning. I'm calling from the University of Tecama, Technological University, and this is a question. How do we face mediocre people in an organization if the manager or director of the company has a lot of complexes and limitations and a lot of syndromes, personality uh, problems? Well, we might as well start with the most difficult question first. <laughs> and 
I think there are a lot of uh, aspects of what you're asking about, but at the heart of your question is how do you deal with leaders who just won't lead, who won't embrace a more uh, participatory style? And it's very difficult to for anybody to work in an organization with a leader who uh, is autocratic, almost a demagogue, very difficult. The reality is you almost have to bide your time and hope that he or she will eventually retire, move on, or at least ignore you long enough where you can begin to implement many of your good ideas and try and experiment. Now, the second part of, of the question is, what do you do, and this goes back to our first segment, a question from our first segment, in an organization that's very rigid. I think it's important that within your own micro world, your own business unit, that you continue to try things, to be innovative, but not to the point where you're going to get fired or you're going to upset your boss. I think the challenge is that you have to find the balance where you can experiment, but not to the point where you lose your position. And Tom, sometimes aren't there informal power structures that actually exist within an organization uh, so that without totally subverting your leader, uh, you can still exercise leadership on your own? Right. Peter, that's a great point. Now keep in mind that there are different uh, methods of leadership and what Peter's alluding to is there's a formal leadership structure but I think the most powerful structure within an organization is your informal leadership structure and you might find that you can be more successful in going through the informal leadership channels than trying to take on your uh, boss who may be very uh, rigid uh, very traditional and not allow you to think outside the box. Mm -hmm. Good good point, Peter. Uh, yes, from uh, the Dominican Republic comes our next question from uh, Codotel uh, Santo Domingo. Uh, we lost that call, but now we have one coming in from Mexico City. First of all, I want to congratulate you for this wonderful topic, where, which I believe it generates a lot of awareness for a very firm and sound leadership, which is what you're promoting here. These thoughts and these concerns I inherited, I got from Licenciado Cornejo, Leader is, here I serve, says, here I serve, and which corresponds to the spirit of Gandhi and Christ, which you mentioned. The real boss said, here I serve myself. Those are the ones that are politicians, administrators, and military. So how can you really generate a true leadership? A leader inspires confidence and trust. Enthusiasm. A leader envelops the others in a sympathetic environment, in a nice, is charismatic, empowers its people, his people. When the leader is present, the, the group feels strengthened. If you are afraid of your boss, if you are afraid of your superior, then he's a boss, but if you love your boss, then he's your leader. Gentlemen, the question is, what do you do when, for the bosses that say, here I serve myself, how can we leave them out of the system and let them stay home and so that they can extinct, become extinct like the dinosaurs? What do you think? Go for it, Tom. Well, first of all, uh, thank you. Excellent question. And uh, it raises uh, a very crucial dimension of leadership, and that is uh, some leaders only know the style of leading by fear and intimidation. And hopefully 
uh, most of you in the audience do not work for somebody or you do not use that style. There are times when fear and intimidation works, but again, in this day and age, I, I think it's, it's an outdated mode that drives more people away from you than embraces people. Uh, with regard to service to others, one of the most popular themes of leadership in the 1990s, and I think it's continuing to grow and gain momentum in the 21st century, is this whole aspect of uh, servitude, of, of service leadership. Uh, you mentioned Gandhi, for example. The power of your ideas is what's going to attract people to you. You can lead by being of service to people. And I think personally, as we get a little older, it's not so much about success, because hopefully we'll all be successful, but it's really how will they remember you? What's your contribution? What is your significance to the organization and to society? If, as a leader, you are about yourself, your ego gratification, that's not going to gain you the reputation that you want to leave behind, in my view. Uh, there's no point in trying to be a bully when, in fact, you can embrace others, grow others, and help others uh, develop their ideas. That's the greatest contribution. And, and that's why I use the example of Gandhi or Jesus or any other great leader, because uh, these individuals have left a tremendous impact on our society because of their ideas, not because they bullied people, not because they didn't embrace other ideas, but because they were inclusive in their leadership style. So hopefully that's the kind of leader you are. All right. <clears throat> we have a call coming in from uh, Sinaloa province in Mexico from the Universidad de Occidente. This is a question from the University of Occidente from the Mochis campus. The question is, how can the universities of today f uh, form, train market, mer market leaders and that they... ¿Podría repetir, por favor, más despacito? Aló, por favor. Sí, claro que sí. Sí. If, how can the universities train market leaders that can also apply their leadership in the companies in a changing economy? Thank you. Gracias. I want to make sure that I understand the nature of your question because universities have a tremendous responsibility of taking what I will call raw talent and shaping the minds of potential leaders. And I think uh, hopefully your question is directed more towards the, the student population rather than the faculty. I've always believed that the great universities aren't necessarily the ones that teach engineering or medicine or law or a specific discipline, but rather they teach students how to think, how to be creative how to exercise the tremendous brain power that they have. And I think that's the job of the university, uh, certainly a part of the university's job, is to challenge people to think. Plato and Aristotle, if we go back thousands of years, their whole mission in life was to challenge how people think and to teach them to debate their ideas and defend their principles. And I think that is a tremendous gift that the universities have inherited today. And if universities do a great job at that, they will have the kind of success that just in this morning's paper here in San Diego, Stanford University, which is in the Silicon Valley of Palo Alto, California, here in the United States, just received a contribution of over four hundred million dollars from the founders of Hewlett Packard. So that's the kind of reward that universities will get if in fact they do teach leaders 
how to think, how to be successful, and then, of course, they can market those leaders back into their universities. Uh, one other quick point that I think is important here is that I see many leaders who like to go back into the university environment to teach and to share and to give, uh, give back to the student population and to the university environment. Okay, we have a number of callers, so we're going to move right to our next call from Estado de México, the Universidad Tecnológica. Good morning. From the Technological University de Nezahualcóyotl, we have the following question. In Mexico, 95% of companies approximately are small and medium-sized enterprises, and they have uh, leaders who are within the box. How, what would be the strategy to get them out of the box, considering that Mexican, the Mexican culture? And how much would we have to wait, how long, before we can see economic results? As a, as a result of this uh, getting out of the box? I think there are a lot of similarities, frankly, between the culture, the business culture of the United States and Mexico in that regard. Most of the companies in the United States are small to medium-sized enterprises. I define that as fewer than 200 employees. And frankly, I think that the small to medium-sized enterprise is much more creative than perhaps we're giving them credit for. I think that uh, the leaders of these smaller companies have to be thinking outside the box. They have to be using technology to keep up with their competition. And they have to practice excellent customer service because I think that's their creative edge. We've got time for a final call from uh, Mexico City. Oh, no, that call just left. We have a fax here from... Uh, uh, Calient Agua Calientes, Mexico, uh, and they say our corporate culture is tied to the old way of doing things, the old way of thinking. How can ma a manager introduce new ideas without upsetting their boss? How can uh, they get the boss to uh, try new ideas? Well, this, I think, Peter, gets back to the traditionalist uh, question. And uh, our, our question earlier dealt with the small to medium size. Here, I think this is a problem that is endemic throughout the larger companies, the more traditional companies. And by the way, I, I don't think it's just Mexico. I think it's worldwide that corporate cultures are very traditional and they don't allow for a great deal of flexibility in how people think outside the box. The the way that you as a business unit manager, because if you're the CEO, you can change things. But if you are a small business unit manager, such as 25 employees or some number like that, you have to focus on your area of expertise and Great. try to work through the changes within your own okay. scope. Great. Very good answer and excellent questions. Thank you so much, audience, for uh, participating in our teleconference. We hope that you've enjoyed participating in this exciting multilingual, multinational program. We invite you to participate in our fifth video conference of this series, which will air on May 17th this year, 2001, entitled The Baby Boom Generation, Its Profile, Dynamics, and Markets. For additional information, on this year's video conference series, please consult your participants manual where you will find the dates and specific topics for each program. You may also visit our websites which are listed up here in tectra.com and onlinecompetence.com. On behalf of all of us who collaborate in the International Training Center, I want to thank you for your enthusiastic participation and interest in today's program. Thanks and see you again soon.